Now, is it possible that in this battle between good and evil, that the devil may be using extraordinary paranormal phenomena to prepare for a last day deception that he'll break upon the world? There was a time that we used to think that anybody that talked about UFOs, unidentified flying objects, must be some crazy, wild-eyed fanatic. But have you noticed that there is an increasing interest in extraterrestrial events and affairs, UFO sightings, and unidentified flying objects? Uh, people worldwide have actually uh, reported encounters with these UFOs over the last few years, if you know anything about the movie scene, and I hope you don't know too much about it, um, you'll notice the movies that are on UFOs, identified, unidentified flying objects, uh, space travel, uh, blockbuster hits uh, generating millions and millions of dollars. But government officials in the United States and many other nations have investigated these unidentified aerial phenomena and they've begun declassifying documents and declassifying videos and producing reports for a curious public. And so, so you have to ask yourself some questions. Are extraterrestrials really visiting our planet? Does, does the Bible say anything about these uh, beings from other planets? Are they real? Is this some big hoax? Is it, uh, will we ever have contact with beings from outer space? Uh, are these sightings real or just some grand hoax? Now recently, and this is what kind of prompted me to prepare this message this morning, recently the Pentagon has unclassified a number of documents on identified flying objects. The news media picked up the story, and, and here's what we know. If you've followed the news at all, you've noticed that, what, that you've noticed that uh, Congress has passed a 2.3 trillion spending bill on coronavirus relief package. It was passed in December of 2020. But did you know that in that package, tucked away, there was a stipulation requiring the Department of Defense and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to deliver an unclassified report on unidentified flying objects to Congress within six months? They were to compile what the government knows about these unidentified flying objects that are rocketing over American airspace. Now, the long-awaited re report was just released. Now, it only has nine pages, but it tells us more about this subject than anything that the American public has ever known before. As I was reading it, I was quite shocked and amazed at what the government actually knows and the report that was given to Congress. The first thing that was interesting, and here's what we know. Over the last few years, the government has reported 144 contacts with these UFOs or unidentified flying objects from military pilots. In addition to that, most of these came from 2004 to 2021, but the large amount were in the last couple of years. Now, as they looked at these 144 reports from military pilots, they could only identify one that was kind of a deflated balloon that was flying in the sky. Somebody thought that was an unidentified flying object. But the rest remained unexplained. Now, in a total of 18 of these reports, according to the report released by the Pentagon just a few weeks ago, that they reported that these UFOs had unusual flight patterns that they could uh, resist great wind, uh, blow, the wind blowing against them, that they could speed very quickly away with no uh, record or no indication of jet propulsion, that they could go against the wind. They began to also notice that on a number of them, a small number, that the uh, military had picked up radio frequency energy coming from these sightings. In 11 instances, United States airline pilots said that they had near misses with UFOs. Now, 
one of the basic questions we need to raise is, has this planet ever been visited by aliens or beings of any form from out of space? Are we in this universe alone? Uh, is planet Earth the only populated planet in our universe? If there are beings on other planets, what are, the, what are they really like? And what does this all have to do with you and me today in this battle between good and evil, in the great controversy between Christ and Satan? Now, the Bible does not give us all the answers about unidentified flying objects, but it does reveal that our planet is in the midst of a cosmic conflict between good and evil, and that we are not the only created beings in the universe. Good and evil angels battle for our minds. They battle for the supremacy of the world. So let's look for a few moments at the evidence in the Bible for life on other planets. Let's look at that evidence in Scripture. Now, is it possible that in this battle between good and evil, that the devil may be using extraordinary paranormal phenomena to prepare for a last-day deception that he'll break upon the world. So first, is there evidence for life on other planets? And if there is, um, what kind of life is that? Is it fallen beings? Is it unfallen beings? We're going to the book of Job, Job chapter 1. We're looking there at Job, the first chapter, to try to get a picture of this great controversy between good and evil. Job chapter 1, you're looking there at verse 6. Now there was a day, now there was a day, in the far distant past, in the millenniums in the past, in thousands of years in the future, in the, in the past that relates to our present future. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came from among them. And the Lord said to Satan, where do you come from? So Satan answered the Lord and said, I, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So here you have a text in the Bible that says there's this meeting in heaven. And in this council meeting in heaven, the sons of God, and we need to find out who they are. They're obviously not fallen beings, because if they were fallen beings, they wouldn't be called the sons of God, right? So it says, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came from among them, and the Lord says to Satan, where'd you come from? And he said, well, I've come from the earth. So evidently, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's the prince of this world. You remember Jesus said, the prince of this world comes, and he has nothing in me. So evidently, Satan represents this planet, but these sons of God must represent other unfallen planets in the universe that God has created. You find this in Job chapter 2 as well. Job chapter 2 describes this again, and it says, Job 2 verse 1, again there was a day, so it's a different day, that the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also from among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come from? So Satan answered and said, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down upon it. So you have these two council meetings in heaven. Sons of God come, meet before the Lord. Satan comes as a representative of earth. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament by 70 Jewish scholars. When the Septuagint translates this expression, the sons of God, looking at the Hebrew of that, it says the angels of God. So evidently, God created angelic beings, and these angelic beings inhabit different places or planets in the universe someplace, far beyond our solar system. Satan comes representing the earth. Now, does the Bible teach that God created worlds and not only this world? It does. You look at Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, if you have your Bible, take it and take a look at Hebrews 1. So we're setting forth the fact that God has created varying worlds in the universe and that there is biblical evidence for those worlds. 
and that there's a host of good angels, angelic beings. We're going to study about these angelic beings this morning. And we're going to look at the good and evil angels and see this conflict between good and evil. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, that's the prophetic word, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Now read the last phrase with me. You ready to read? Through whom also he made the what? The what? The worlds. So according to the Bible, there was a time that the sons of God came to appear before him. These sons of God are angelic beings. They appear before God. Satan comes from planet earth to appear before God. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says God created the worlds. So in these angelic worlds, in these galaxies far distant from ours, they're not fallen by sin. The earth is the only planet, the Bible says, has fallen by sin. It was here to this earth that Christ came. But the Bible speaks about an innumerable company of angels, Hebrews 12, 22. The Bible speaks about 10,000 times 10,000 angels in Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10. In Genesis 28, the Bible speaks of, remember, about, about Jacob fleeing from his brother Esau, and he sees this ladder come down from heaven as he's praying, and angels come up and down on that ladder. We have been visited by beings from out of space. They are not beings in some flying saucer, but they are rather angelic beings. If you could sweep the curtain aside and we could see with eyes divinely anointed, we would see good angels coming and visiting planet Earth. We find these good angels throughout the Bible. They are sent on messages of mercy to the people of God. To Abraham, they came with promises of blessing. You'll recall Abraham met two strangers approaching his home. The strangers were angels, and Abraham entertained them and blessed the entire household. Angels approached Lot and hastened him out of Sodom before its fiery destruction. Angels nourished Elijah when he was about ready to perish from weariness and hunger in the desert. Angels protected Elisha from... And remember, they gave him a vision. Elisha is trapped in this city. And his servant says, Elisha, we're going to be attacked. We're going to be destroyed. And Elisha says, with eyes divinely enlightened, they that are with us are more than they that are with them. Open your eyes. And there were chariots of fire with angels all protecting them. Angels appeared to Daniel when he sought divine wisdom in Babylon. Angels shut the mouths of lions when they wanted Daniel for lunch and they weren't vegetarians. <laughs> Angels delivered Peter when he was doomed to death in Herod's dungeon and directed him also to Cornelius to lead the Roman centurion to truth about Jesus. Angels visited Paul in prison and Paul and Silas saw the prison knocked down. Holy, righteous angels are God's ambassadors sent by heaven to guide, protect, impress, strengthen, and deliver his people. Angels loyal to God are God's ambassadors in this conflict. Are you not thrilled with the sense that the good angels outnumber the bad angels two to one? And I'll show you that later from the Bible. Aren't you thrilled to know that the God that sent angels to protect, guide, direct, and strengthen his children is not asleep up there someplace. And as we seek him in prayer, he sends heavenly angels to us today to beat back the forces of hell so that we can triumph in the conflict between good and evil. Every asset that God could provide for our salvation, he has provided. Here are three powerful passages on angels. Two in the Old Testament, the other in the New. Psalm 91, verse 11. Psalm 91, verse 11. You're taking your Bibles, going back to the book of Psalms. We are not alone in the struggle. We are not alone in the conflict. The God of heaven has sent forth angels. Psalm 91, verse 11. 
For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Angelic beings sent from heaven have charge over us to protect, to guide, to strengthen. Psalm 34, verse 7. I picked up a, a real nice nuance of this verse in the New Living Translation. I'll read it in the New King James, then I'll go back to the New Living, and I think you're going to really grasp something from that. Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord camps round about those who fears him and delivers them. Here's what the New Living Translation says. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who, those who fear him. So when the devil comes upon you with the hellish forces of evil, when the devil comes upon you with the demonic forces of darkness, remember, Psalm 34, 7, for the angel of the Lord is on guard, and he surrounds and defends all those who fear him. Hebrews 1, verse 14, three powerful passages, three powerful passages on the righteous, holy, good, just angels that surround us, protect us, defend us. Hebrews 1, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Some passages read, for those who are inheriting salvation. So these good angels surround us. These good angels guide us. These good angels protect us. As you kneel in prayer, thank God for his love. Thank Jesus for the message of salvation. Thank the Holy Spirit for convicting your heart. And thank God for the heavenly angels. Those angels that surround and protect and guide us. Now the Bible teaches that there are not only righteous angels loyal to God seeking our good, but that there are evil angels seeking our destruction. The Bible teaches that one-third of the angels listened to Satan's lies, were deceived by Satan, and fell. We find that in Revelation 12, verse 7 to 10. It was so beautifully read in our scripture reading this morning. Revelation chapter 12. You're looking there to start at verse 7 to 10, and then we're going to go back to verse 4. Revelation 12, verse 7 to 10, and then back to verse 4. And war broke out in heaven, a strange place for war. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, and they did not prevail. You want to circle those four words, you want to underline them, and you want to have them deeply indelibly impressed in your consciousness. They did not prevail. The evil angels that battled against Jesus in heaven did not prevail there, and they will not prevail in your life. The evil angels did not win that battle, and through Christ, they're not going to win the battle in your life. Jesus cast the evil angels out of heaven, and he'll cast the evil influences out of your life. They did not prevail. Nor was a place for them found anymore in heaven any longer. So the great dragon, that's Satan, was cast out, the serpent called the devil and Satan. Now notice, the devil is called the dragon, and he's also called the serpent. He's called the dragon because he destroys and the serpent because he deceives. He deceives those who he wants to destroy and destroys those whom he has deceived. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. If the devil had followers in heaven in a perfect world, and he deceived one-third of the angels, would you not conclude that his deceptions are very, very seductive and very cunning? Would you not then conclude, if he can deceive angels in a perfect world, that we must clearly understand how to overcome his wiles as they are trying to destroy us and deceive us? Now, how many of the angels were cast out of heaven? You go back to verse 4. Speaking in verse 3, another angel appeared in heaven, behold, a fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns. And it says there, and seven diadems on his head. 
His tail, that's the dragon's tail, drew a third of the stars of heaven. Stars of heaven are the angels, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So how many of the evil, how many of the angels were not loyal to Christ, but were cast out of heaven? How many of those? One third. How many of the angels remained loyal then? Well, you're good mathematical students. I knew that. Two thirds of the angels, see, they were loyal to God. So here's the incredible good news. However many evil angels Satan had, how many ever thousands they are, we don't know. God has twice as many good angels. However many evil angels Satan has, God has these good, righteous, holy angels to surround and protect us. Now, Satan is a great deceiver. He deceives a third of the angels. And we're in a battle. This is a conflict between good and evil. This is a great controversy. Ephesians 6, verse 12. We're in a great controversy between good and evil. And we want to discover this morning, in this battle, how can we be victorious? How can the, we, we take advantage of everything that Christ has provided for us? Ephesians 6 and verse 12. We are in a battle. And as we enter the final days of human history, the devil's attacks will not become any less. They will become fiercer. He will use his deceptive, cunning power to mold our minds to conformity to this world, to lead us to temptation, to separate us from Christ. But we need not fear because Jesus is more powerful than the evil one. We have heavenly angels that will come to our aid to enable us to triumph over the powers of darkness. Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. Who are the rulers of darkness of this age? They're the evil angels. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Who are the spiritual hosts of wickedness? They're the evil angels in the heavenly places. Therefore, take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand. So here we battle, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There is a battle and the battle is for your mind. The greatest battle in earth's history is not going to be some battle in the Middle East between opposing forces there. It's not some battle for, for, for Jerusalem. It is the battle for the human mind. And the devil is doing everything he can to capture your mind. He's doing everything he can to influence your thoughts. He's doing everything he can to dislodge your affections from Christ because the devil wants as many people lost as possible. But thank God, Jesus has provided salvation for all. Thank God the Holy Spirit has provided power to overcome. Thank God there are heavenly angels to guide and to assist even in the most difficult times, even in the hardest places, even in the most unusual circumstances. I've told you a number of stories about my dear friend Mikhail Kulikov, but I'll tell you one I haven't told you before. Mikhail Kulikov was the president of our work, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Soviet times in Russia. He and I were dear, dear friends. We often traveled together in the Soviet night and he would share with me his experiences in prison, share with me what it meant to stand for Christ, share with me what he meant when he was oppressed by evil forces, when the government was trying to oppress God's people there. He told me that on one occasion he was put in prison for five years. And during the time in prison, he was praying, Oh God, oh God, in this prison, bring your light, bring your truth to me more deeply. I asked him, what, what was the most difficult time in prison? He said, Mark, the loneliness, the loneliness. He said, secondly, the hunger. He said, I, I was always constantly hungry. He said, thirdly, the shivering cold. I was cold. I was hungry. My body was weakened with the horrible conditions, and you're about ready to give in under those circumstances. But he said, often, often it was like angels were in my cell. Often it was like the cell was illuminated with the glory of God. And he said, let me tell you an interesting story. He said, in prison, there were many rabbis, Jewish rabbis, and I always wanted to learn Hebrew. 
So my graduate course became a prison course in Hebrew. The rabbis taught me Hebrew. And then he said, I wanted to learn Greek. And I met a Greek scholar in prison, New Testament Greek scholar, and he taught me Greek. And I wanted to learn English. So I learned somebody else and found, taught me English. So he said, in prison, those five years, I learned Hebrew, Greek, and English. When he got out of prison, he established the Russian Bible Institute, Russian Bible Translation Institute, because the old Russian Bible was written in a form of Russian called Synodal Russian. And it was very hard for anybody to understand. So he got out of prison and he said, now that I know the Hebrew of the Old Testament, I know the Greek of the New Testament, I'm going to work with a, start a Bible translation institute and translate from the original languages of Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. I'm going to translate the Bible so the Russian people can read it. It was a 10-year project, and he translated into Russian, and you see it here on the screen. This is a Russian edition of the Bible. Incidentally, I had one of the first copies that came off the press. It was a Russian edition of the Bible that was translated by Pastor Kulikov's team. It took them 10 years to translate it. And now that is the standard Bible used in Russia. All because he learned Hebrew and Greek and English in prison, guided by heavenly forces and angels. Satan has a third of the angels, but God has two-thirds. And when the final crisis breaks upon this world with unabated fury, the devil is going to use force. He's going to use coercion. He's even going to use false miracles to try to get us to disobey Christ. He's going to seduce us in areas that we do not expect. One of the ways he's going to work in the last days is through signs, wonders, and false miracles. And to a media-minded generation that wants the sensational, the devil is going to pull off sensational miracles. What if, now don't you go away and say, Pastor Finley predicted that, because I'm not. I'm saying, what if? What if there were cosmic beings that landed or appeared in Washington, D.C.? What if they're in a great stadium? What if people were coming and being healed, so-called, I put quotes around, healed of cancer and heart disease? Well, what if anything like that ever happened? You say, Pastor Mark, it cannot happen. Did you read your Bible? Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. You see, to a generation that's looking for the sensational, wanting signs and wonders and miracles, the devil's going to give them what they want. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians. You're looking there in the Bible. God is preparing us for the almost overwhelming delusions that's going to come. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And you notice we're going to start there with 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, that's the coming of Christ, will not... Come unless there is a falling away. That's an apostasy first. The man of sin is going to be revealed. He opposes himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. He sits in the, as God in the temple of God, showing himself he is God. So there will be a being that will attempt to, an individual, a person who tries, to, a religious leader who tries to unite church and state, sits in the temple of God. That is, he claims, he, he speaks from the chair, ex cathedra, infallible. But notice how the devil is going to deceive, verse 8 and on. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord is going to consume with the breath of his mouth, destroy with the brightness of his coming. But notice verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power. What is the word before power? Everybody, what is that? All power. With all signs, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So the devil is going to work with all power, with all signs, with all lying wonders. He will work miracles to deceive. And if one is not anchored in the word of God and wants sensational miracles and substitutes miracles for truth, they will be deceived. Now notice what scripture says. Verse 10, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. 
because they did not receive what everybody? Love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Can you believe a lie? If you believe a lie long enough, will the lie become truth? But if I believe it long enough, you can never know a lie. You can only know the truth. But you can believe a lie. And so what the devil is going to do is going to attempt to work sensational miracles for a generation that does not know the word of God, who wants sensational, who wants emotional, and the devil will work those miracles to draw them in, and the Bible tells us why they're going to be deceived. It says because they received not a love of what? The truth. So what's our safeguard in these last days? It is a love of what? The truth. Revelation, the 13th chapter, the 14th and 15th verses. Revelation, the 13th chapter, the 14th and 15th verses. We're looking here at Revelation 13, verse 14, verse 15. And here, again, what is the devil's goal in deception? Well, it says in Revelation 13, that he would deceive those who dwell on the earth by the signs and wonders that he could perform in the sight of the beast. Now, if you have the King James Version, you have King James Version? What does it substitute? What does it say for signs and wonders there? Use another word. What is it? Miracles. You got it. So these signs and wonders are false miracles that deceive them who do they deceive? Who do these false miracles deceive? What does the Bible say? It deceives those that receive what? The mark of the beast. So the devil is going to unite church and state in an attempt to enforce his decrees. He will use false miracles to give so-called credibility to his work and activity. Revelation, the 19th chapter in the 20th verse. So there's a battle between good and evil in the universe. The good angels and the evil angels fight in this battle. In this battle, just before the end of time, Satan is going to pull out every stop he can to deceive. He will use false miracles. Now, does God work miracles? Yes. Can God work miracles? Certainly. Will God work miracles in the last days of earth's history? Definitely. But will he work miracles to strengthen people in their disobedience of the clear teachings of God's word. Will he do that? Not at all. So the true miracles of God lead people to faithfulness to God's word. They lead people to a deeper experience with Christ. False miracles lead you to be anchored in the falsehood that you've already believed. Okay? Revelation 19 and verse 20. Then the beast was captured. This is talking about the second coming of Christ when Satan is bound as the millennial period begins, according to Revelation 20. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who works signs in the presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. The King James Version says he worked miracles. So signs, wonders, and miracles will be used to deceive those that receive the mark of the beast. But there's one final, last deception of Satan. If the world is waiting for the second coming of Christ, would it not be just like Satan to pull off or attempt to pull off a counterfeit second coming? Could it be possible that he would use, notice my words carefully, could it be possible that he would use technology to try to do that? Could it be possible that the world is being conditioned for an invasion from out of space through the paranormal movies and all these space movies? And what if the devil pulled off a counterfeit second coming he could never counterfeit the way Jesus is going to come. The Bible says, Revelation 1, 7, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. When Jesus comes, every eye is going to see him. 
When Jesus comes, it's going to be lightning from the east to the west. When Christ comes, his feet will not touch the earth. When Christ comes, the graves will be open. The devil can't do that, can he? He can't resurrect the dead, right? When, 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 when Jesus comes, the righteous living will be transformed to receive immortal bodies will be caught up in the sky. But what if the devil appeared in Paris? What if he then appeared in Rome? What if he appeared in Washington, Chicago, Los Angeles? What if there were great meetings? What if people, does the Bible indicate that at all? Does the Bible even hint of that? Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, we're looking there at verse 11. And let's look even a little earlier than that. Revelation 11, 12, 11, and we're going to look at verse 12. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, 12, Revelation 12, 11, and by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives to death. In other words, these people were anchored in Christ. They, they testified for Christ. They gave their lives for Christ. Now notice verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. The devil has come down to you. In other words, he's appeared to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. So just before the coming of Jesus, the devil knows that he has a short time and he will come down to try to destroy. Remember in the book of Corinthians, Paul says that Satan himself is transformed into what? An angel of light. This, the appearance of Satan as the great miracle worker is the almost overmastering delusion. Satan's impersonation of Christ. Now, there is quite a remarkable statement in the book, Great Controversy. And I'm going to look at two statements. One I have on the screen, the other I will read to you from the book, Great Controversy. The book, Great Controversy, helps to prepare us for the events that are coming. Notice this statement. Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. So, in, in the laboratories of hell, with his evil angels, he's developing his last day strategy. Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. So there'll be evil angels working. There'll be so-called appearances of dead loved ones. So if you don't know the truth, you can be swept away. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time, says the prophet. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. They're the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth. So he's going to work miracles of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14. Except those who are kept by the power of God through faith in his word. How are we kept, everybody? How are we kept? Through what? The power of God. And through faith in miracles? Faith in signs and wonders? Faith in what? His word. The whole world will be swept into the ranks of delusion. The people are fast being lulled to a fatal security to be awakened only by the outpouring of the wrath of God. Now, I want to pick up another state, the Great Controversy, page 624, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception. Satan himself will impersonate Christ. Did we read that in Revelation 12, verse 12? Did we read that? That Satan is going to come down and try to impersonate Christ. Now the deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God in Revelation 1. The shout will go up, Christ has come, Christ has come. But will it be the true Christ? Indeed, it will be not not be. How can we be protected from this? Have we ever been... Have we ever been visited in this planet by heavenly beings? Indeed, we have. Angels of God have come. But has Christ ever come once? He came once and he's coming again. And it's this Christ that came the first time that is coming the second time that can protect us. The creator of the universe, the almighty one, paid a visit to this planet 2,000 years ago. Galatians 4.4 4 says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. He sent forth his son at the fullness of time the first time, and he'll send forth his son at the fullness of time the second time. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus came once, he's coming again. As we have seen and do testify, the Father sent the Son, 1 John 4, verse 14. 
1 Timothy 1, verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptations that Christ came into the world to save sinners. See, all through the Bible, he came once and he's coming again. 1 John 5, verse 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It is faith in this Christ that came once, faith in his grace, faith in his mercy, faith in his forgiveness, faith in his staying power. It is belief in his word that will enable us to overcome. What is faith? It is believing and trusting the promises of God. It's being anchored in Christ, anchored in his word. It is not some superficial Christian experience where you expect some electrical impulse to go up your spine so you feel good. It is a solid bedrock faith that cannot be moved in spite of everything around you that is appealing to your senses to surrender your faith. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul tells us just how to survive in the last days. You and I can be survivors and not statistics. You can I and I can survive the overwhelming deception that's coming upon this world. Heaven has provided every resource for us. Ephesians chapter 6. We look there at verse 14. Remember in verse 12, it says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the host of wickedness, against the powers of hell. Verse 14. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking above all the shield of faith. Stand, therefore, girding your waist with truth. In the ancient world, the ancient Roman soldiers had a, they girded their waist with, armor around their waist because when you're fighting hand to hand with swords, the first place you try to pierce is here in the stomach area. And it says, gird your waist with truth. There's a wonderful statement in the book in heavenly places that describes how God's people will be protected. It's found here in heavenly places, page 297. Satan brings all his powers to the assault in the last close conflict. All his powers. And the endurance of the follower of Christ is taxed to the utmost. At times it seems that he must yield. But a word of prayer to the Lord Jesus goes like an arrow to the throne of God. And angels of God are sent to the field of battle. Then the tide is turned. Our minds are filled with the word of God. On our knees we're praying and we send word to Christ. And as we send that word to Jesus through prayer, he sends heavenly angels. And those heavenly angels come down to guide and protect. Prayer is a powerful weapon to defeat the forces of hell. Prayer and the word of God are our safeguards. The role of angels in the relationship to the Bible and prayer is clear. Heavenly angels bear witness to the word of God. As we study it, heavenly angels come to beat back the forces of hell so we can understand the word of God. Heavenly angels minister to those who will be heirs of salvation. Heavenly angels assist us in our understanding of the word of God. In this cosmic conflict between good and evil, heavenly angels beat back the forces of hell. Prayer, the word of God. Commitment to Christ, willingness to do whatever he asks us to do, that is our armor of protection. Just a couple weeks ago, I attended the annual council of the Seventh Adventist Church. In this annual council, our world leaders meet together from all over the world, and we hear reports, we hear stories from all over the world. We hear reports from China, where a number of our pastors are currently in prison. We hear reports from Africa and what God is doing there, reports from the former Soviet Union. One of the reports that thrilled my heart this time was a report of angel deliverance. 
The story was told by Arthur Stella, one of my colleagues, one of the vice presidents of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And Arthur shared with us this story during the Soviet days because we were going back as leaders and looking at the miracles that God has worked in the past. During the Soviet days, one of our pastors was put in prison. It was a very difficult circumstance. The prison was cold and dark and damp, and the prison guard was unusually cruel. In the interrogation of this Adventist pastor, the prison guard said this. He said, do you believe in the miracles of the Bible? And of course, our Adventist pastor said, yes. Do you believe that, that Jesus could break the bread and feed 5,000? Of course. Do you believe Jesus could heal the sick? Of course. Do you believe Jesus could walk on water? I mean, that's just a myth. That's no story. It's, it's a myth. Oh, yes, I, I believe that, the pastor said. He said, okay. The prison was right next to a very, very large river, a very deep, dark river, swift current. And the the captain said, come with me. They walked out to the river, and he said, if you believe that Jesus walked on water, then you must believe that he can give you the power to walk on water. So I want to see you walk across that river. The Adventist pastor said to him, give me three days to fast and pray. And he went back to his cell, and he fasted, and he prayed. The captain called all of the prisoners out to the prison yard that day. And he said, all right, walk, walk, walk. The Adventist pastor knelt down by the side of the river. And there as he knelt down, he saw a vision in his mind. And the vision was a bridge across the river. And in that vision, the angelic being said to him, go now and walk. He got up and walked across the bridge that nobody else saw. All they saw was him walking across the water. And he came back. The captain was absolutely amazed. And many of those prisoners accepted Christ. In the last days of Earth's history, we will be in very trying, very difficult circumstances. But two-thirds of the angels of heaven are at our side. Jesus Christ is at our side. The Heavenly Father is at our side. We have nothing to fear because Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. The crisis will come. The challenges will come. But as we fill our minds with the word of God, as our hearts are one with Christ through prayer, as we understand that Jesus has done everything he could to protect us in the crisis, although the devil will work his miracles, although the devil will appear, we will cry out one day. As we see Christ coming in the clouds of glory, as we see the heavens illuminated, with his dazzling brightness, we will cry out, Lo, this is our God. We have, what's the next word? Waited for him. Why does it say we've waited for him? Because we haven't accepted the false Christ. We haven't accepted the demonic delusions. We have waited for him. This is our God. This is our God. He's coming in the clouds of heaven. This is our God. He's coming with 10,000 angels. This is our God. He's coming in dazzling brightness. This is our God. He's coming to raise the dead. He's coming to take us home. This is our God. We've waited for him, and he'll save us. What do you say, church? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, in the battle between good and evil, in the battle between Christ and Satan, the devil is doing everything he can to dislodge us from faith in Christ. But we're thankful that two-thirds of the angels of heaven are righteous and holy and are on our side. We're thankful that we're on the winning side. We're thankful that we need not fear. We're thankful that prayer and Bible study will anchor us. We're thankful that one day we can look into heaven and say, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. We look forward to that day. Keep us faithful to that day. In Christ's name, amen.